I'm Bad Brad Berkwit from America. I'm Gore Depp from Canada. And we welcome you to our show, Last Stop, The Twilight Zone Show. <laughs> Folks, is that not the coolest guitar riff ever? One of the best TV show themes ever, too, I think. All right, folks, I don't know if Big Brother's watching me, but if you hear this meeting is being recorded, and then when we log off, that's the end of the meeting, that must be an update that uh, Zoom has done. If not, then, hey, maybe somebody's watching me. I'm in the Twilight Zone, literally. So, hey, it's been about three and a half, three weeks, four weeks since we last did a show. I'm in the middle of uh, selling, we're in the middle of selling our home and moving to another home, so relocating offices and all that kind of stuff. So that's why we haven't been on, but we're back today. So what's going on with you, Gordon? No, it's, uh, it's pretty exciting moving houses. I don't know how your brain can function today. I know what it's like to move. It just like, you know, takes over everything. But it sounds like you're pretty happy with this new place. Oh, yeah. Is, is this like a Twilight Zone neighborhood? You know, those perfect picket fences and the, you know, and the, the Stepford Wives kind of uh, neighbors and stuff, <laughs> is it? Well, the only thing I correct you on picket fences is that HOA does not allow you to have uh, fences, but they do allow you to have an electric fence, which I won't do because they're dogs. So Santino and Bella now have to, we're getting these things that you put in the ground, they're stakes, and then they got the, the, the collar thing that goes out. Yeah. So it'll, it'll go out only so far. And we got woods behind us, so I don't, I don't want them to go into the woods. But yeah, yeah we're happy about that. Uh, before we get into this episode today, I want to... Um, speak on Memorial Day. I'm not here to lecture anybody, but I just want to put it in perspective, being a career Navy person for 20 years and 28 days. Memorial Day, folks, is for the people that we lost in all the wars that have happened. Uh, Veterans Day, because a lot of people reached out to me and said, Happy Memorial Day. I appreciate the sentiment, but really Veterans Day is, is for the living for us. So in memory of all the fallen men and women over many years in different wars, and, and Rod uh, served in World War II, and Ann just put up a thing about he had PTSD the rest of his life from being in World War II. And you could tell in a lot of his episodes that it was there. Um, we remember you on this Memorial Day. Um, we appreciate we uh, appreciate the sacrifice, the families that lost loved ones that are still around and, and cherish their memories. I don't really like saying Happy Memorial Day. I just like to say we honor the fallen on Memorial Day. So I wanted to get that out before we started. So. Again, welcome back to Last Stop, the Twilight Zone show. I'm excited to do this one. Uh, today, we're going to do, we're still on season one, and we're reviewing episode 10 that aired on December 4th, 1959, Gord's favorite year, the year he was born. It starred Nehemiah Persoff. Ben Wright, Patrick McNee, and a very young James Franciscus. And I'll talk about him later when I do trivia and facts. I got some interesting things. So it was written by Rod Serling and was directed by John Bram. Now I'll turn it over to Gore to do the, the uh, synopsis. Yeah, it's a little different uh, setting. It's 1942, in you know, wartime, British ship was crossing the Atlantic, leaving from Liverpool. Uh, I, I, Liverpool's great, because Black Seagulls from Liverpool. I, get, I always think of Beatles and uh, Black Seagulls. When we, I go into New York City, um, and there's fear of being being followed or hit by a German submarine. I mean, then they're going through the fog. They get disconnected from their, what do you call it, their convoy, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's this character named Mr. Lancer. He's the main actor. And he's, he's just completely disorientated. He doesn't know how he got there. He, he walks around the ship like a zombie, sort of. He, he, he just doesn't know where, how he got there, why, why he's there. But he has this weird foreboding. Something terrible is going to happen. And, uh, and as he pieces things together, he has a strange knowledge of things like 
German submarines and look at them like, how would you know those kind of things, you know? And he has an accent and he doesn't know why. He doesn't, he doesn't remember where he was born, you know? Um, he's always on edge. He's, he's confused about his whole life where he came from. No, no, he does. Slowly, he actually does. He does. He, he's, yeah, he, slowly. He, yeah, yeah. he says, no, no, you had said he, he doesn't know where he's born. He does because he says he's from Frankfurt, Germany. Oh, yeah, just later on, you know, as he pieces his life together. Okay, okay, okay. And his accent and stuff. And, and I'm surprised they, they're, they're a little weary of him because they're obviously wartime. There's a German guy, you know, the happy accent. Um, he has this feeling of deja vu, like something's going to be going on. Um, all of a sudden, the steward is in his room and he finds a cap, you know, a mili like a Navy cap. He looks inside and there's Mr. Lancer's name and it says he's a captain. It's a, a captain of a German ship on our ship, but it doesn't make any sense. And so, so the crew is sort of piecing things together as he's piecing things together. And um, he sees the clock in the, in the mess hall or it is, or the, you know, where they have the food. And he, for some reason, he knows at 1.15 something's going to happen. He doesn't know what. And he decides he's got to warn people, even though he doesn't know what he's warning them about. But he says, we're in danger. You know, there's German submarines out there. And, and nobody else seems to worry that much. I don't know why they're not so worried. But um, all of a sudden, the ship stops moving. The engines stop and you know something's wrong. Know, because they're now they're a floating target pretty well right um he runs outside he's he, he kind of goes into a friend he's running around the ship and all of a sudden the ship is deserted and then he sees i think think some of the crew and there's women and children on the ship it's not a military ship um but they're i think they're ghostly sort of almost like ghostly images at this point you know as you the scene of uh, jack torrance running to the um overlook hotel and seeing like little ghostly characters from from the story um finally he he just comes to this climax. He gets a pair of binoculars and he can see a light in the fog, which he knows is the German submarine. You're going to knock him out of the water, right? He, he looks with the binoculars and guess what he sees? He sees the captain of the other ship is him. So he is a captain. And through some twist of fate in the Twilight Zone, he's now a victim of his own evil. You know, it's just, so anyways, they do shoot the ship. He tries to, you know, save people, warn people, but it's too late and the ship gets down and then they cut to the german submarine and there he is as the german captain of the ship and he's he's cool about it you know he's not it's part of the job right but an, another fellow comes in i don't know what his position is and he 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 kind of seems uneasy he says you know you know we there were women and children on that ship you know that we we this is not not right you know and he has but our character doesn't seem to get it and i think that's why he's stuck in this this loop on the twilight zone because the guy even says to him, I think you're, we're doomed. You know, we're, we're doomed in hell because of what we've just done to, to live this over and over again. And then all of a sudden, you know, obviously you realize that he's got to relive that night mm -hmm. and go back to the ship as a passenger and relive that night of, of bombing himself, and, you know, or torpedoing himself and feeling that fear and anguish and not being able to save anybody. Um, so he's going to be stuck in 1942 for the rest of us for eternity. You know, if that's a version of, of hell, I guess, in Rod Sterling's Twilight Zone, that you, you, you learn your lesson, but, but I guess he wasn't learning it, so he had to keep doing it over and over again. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a twisted, dark, um, uneasy one, you know? Like I said, I got, there's a lot of ones that I liked in Twilight Zone because they had a certain vibe to them. This is a very good episode, but it just leaves you feeling very uneasy about how, how fate and... Um, you know, can get you in the end. But then, then again, he was an evil character, so he, he kind of deserved it. Mm -hmm. But it kind of makes you think about what hell could possibly be, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so that's pretty well the story. You know, it's very simple. It's, like, it's, not, it's not a big, uh, complex story. It's just the, you kind of see it coming, I think, as you go. I had the feeling, you know, as, as it went along. So um, how about you? Uh, do you have any, any trivia? Any, uh... Yeah, I do. I do. Before I get into trivia facts, you know, Rod was Jewish and he served in World War II. And we know that he did another episode about the Holocaust, the Death Head uh, Revisited, which is really, really deep. Um, I think a lot, I th in this particular episode, I think Rod put a lot of himself in that in dealing with what was going on with the war. And though they weren't Jewish, I, at least there might have been Jewish passions, or genre, I don't know but they mostly were English and there was some Americans on there. But um, because he was so cruel uh, and to shoot it down because it wasn't a ship that, you know, had any ammunition on it. You know, it was, it was a, it was a, uh, basically just a, a, a not terrorist. Like a passenger line. Around a passenger those, yeah. line, right. And so he was, he's, a, I mean, there's casualties in war, unfortunately, but 
that was just, that was cruel. And that's why he deserved it. And yeah, that was hell. And I think in Rod's mind, looking at that, um, seeing people die in war, because unfortunately in war, we, we lose a lot of people, a lot of innocent people get, they drop a bomb and children die or innocent people that had nothing to do with the war may have been against the war, whatever die. And I think that was, Rod was sending that message as well. But uh, I was like Nehemiah Persoff. He was the, the lead character. And I remember seeing him in a small part. My dad was an actor and he, one of his first things that he ever did, he was an extra in On the Waterfront. <laughs> it's kind of funny. He was in the, your dad? Your dad uh, was yeah, my extra? dad was an extra in On the Waterfront. With, with Marlon Brando, right? Yeah, with Marlon Brando. And wow. I know my dad, so my dad being an extra knowing the camera, what he did was he wasn't supposed to step out of the group, but he did one of these step out things. So he could always say, there I am. Oh, you, you know, can see him in the movie? Yeah, yeah, you can see him. He's got a fedora on, yeah. He's oh, that's like, amazing. Did he yeah, need I, to, did I'll he tell hang you out? Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a scene where uh, after Brando gets in a fight with Johnny Friendly, Lee J. Cobb, and he's coming up uh, the gangplank or whatever you call it, and there's a crowd, and my dad steps out. He, he steps, and he steps out again. And, and <laughs> having acted, I know what he was doing with the camera. He was making sure he was, he was seen. But anyways, that's the first time I ever saw Nehemiah Persoff. He was a cab driver, uncredited in that movie. That wasn't his first uncredited role, but first time I became aware of him. And he actually was in a scene, the famous taxi scene when Brando was in the back with Charlie, who was Rod Steiger, who was supposed to get him not to be a rat against the mob. And he's like, you know, they're going back and forth and Charlie couldn't get him to turn. So they let Terry out and Nehemiah Persoff takes him to like a warehouse and he goes like under the warehouse and you can see the, the mafia guy. So, you know, Charlie's getting ready to meet his demise, which again, then he winds up on a, on a meat hook hanging in an alley and, so that's the first time I became aware of Persoff and that. Also, interesting, he is a Jewish actor born in Jerusalem because I thought his performance was really good. And I was thinking as I'm watching him and having acted that he brought his background into playing that Nazi officer because, of course, that affected him and probably some of his loved ones were in the, in the Holocaust. Even though it wasn't the Holocaust, he still was a Nazi officer. So... He's a Jewish actor, and believe it or not, he is still alive, and he is 101 years old. Oh. He's 101. And he, um, last time he acted was in 2003. He, he was born the same year as my, my grandmother, my Italian known in 1919. As well, he was on the old Untouchables. I don't know if you remember that with Robert Stack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he played several different roles. He was great on that. And um, another point that I always like to make, he was playing a German and he was a Jewish actor. And there's two actors in my mind that always come to me that played opposite of what their ethnicity was. James Kahn as Santino Corleone in The Godfather. He's actually Jewish. And in the same movie, Abe Vigoda, who played Salvatore Tessio, who turned on Michael and was the mm -hmm. one that set him up to be murdered. And at the end, they, they got him. He was a Jewish actor, Abe Vigoda too. He played Fish on Barney Miller. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. And another great movie for that is that I have to bring up, because I, I studied this film, was Casablanca, and the, and the main actor who plays the general, the German general, comes Paul in, tries, he's a, he's, um, he was a Jewish actor as well, playing, you know, a really nasty Nazi. <laughs> yep. It's very interesting how they can take those roles on and, you yes. know, and do it. Yes. And I got one for you that's going to make you smile. Nehemiah Persoff was in either your My favorite, favorite movie? Yes, he was. And I know he, that. Who did he play? Well, I forget the name, but he was a, a head gangster guy. In the he was a head gangster. He had a bald cap on, you know, looking like Kojak, Telly Savalas. He played Little Bonaparte, and he's at the table, and he's doing his whole spiel about we made all this money before taxes, and he says, oh, that's right, we didn't pay taxes. And he's pissed yeah, off. Yeah, that's Some Like It Hot, by the way. Yeah, Some Like It Hot. Correct. Yeah. And do you know the, you remember the other gangster that he was mad at? Because a guy came out the cake and, and you know, shot him. Oh, yeah, because we've already seen it. What's his name again from – um. Wasn't he ready in an episode that we did? The other guy? No, no, he, no. No? He was, never, he was never on Twilight Zone. George Raft. George Raft, yeah. George Raft. Sure. So, and the, guy, the guy comes out of the birthday cake with a machine gun. Yep. And he shoots him. So that was from your movie when I saw that research. And I was like, yeah, I bet you knew that one. Now, also, a gentleman who went on two years later for a TV show from 1961 to 1969 that was very, very famous around the world. And I bet you probably liked it. 
was Patrick McNee and he was John Steed in the Avengers. He I was, was going to say that. <laughs> yep. He was on there. He was one of the uh, ship's crew. So you had him and the gentleman that you said that comes on at the end, James Franciscus, he played a lieutenant. To me, he looked like a young, I'm not saying identical, but he had like a young Robert Redford look when Robert yeah. Redford was young. He actually was in a movie you talked about on an episode of this show, a couple of shows back. He was in a sequel because Rod Serling, as we know, wrote just the original Planet of the Apes. But James Franciscus was the star of the sequel to Planet of the Apes, which ah. was um, uh, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. You had mentioned that show before. Mm -hmm. He was the star of it, James Franciscus. He wound up dying very, very young in his early 50s of uh, emphysema. So obviously he was a smoker. But uh, he was the one that came in and had a conscience that told the captain, you know, we did something horrible and we're going to pay for it. And, he, you know, as you said, he didn't, he didn't care that, uh, that he did that. So that's the trivia that I have. You got anything to add to that? Well, the Padme McNee was a nice surprise because I've got sort of a holy tr trinity of shows that I've been wa binge watching during, um, during COVID and all that stuff. And, I, and they're not necessarily similar, but they have kind of a view of the world and, and a, a film style that I like. It's sort of surreal and obviously Twilight Zone. Then there was The Prisoner. I'm talking about that one. Yep, I'm really talking about that one. Um, yep. Sort of an alt uh, TV show from the 60s. That was a... Uh, and then the, the Avengers, especially the years with Emma Peel, <laughs> you know, with, uh, I, I got the whole box set here too. And, and um, those three shows, it's just the mindset behind them. I mean, Avengers was a bit more tongue in cheek. You know, they had some British comedy in there. It was almost like James Bond meets the Twilight Zone. Yeah. There was some surreal, yeah. weird stuff in there. But it was great seeing him because I, I you know, I, I, I relate to him as I do as, you know, as, as all these characters that we growing up as kids, you know, it was um. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So, so that was very, very, very cool. And I, I, I just find that watching the show that people I completely forgot about will pop up in shows. There's always the obvious ones. Everybody knows, you know, um, what's his name from, um, from Star Trek, um, William Shatner. the Canadian, William Shatner. William Shatner. He's like an obvious one, you know, but there's some other guys. Oh my God. There's like, everybody seemed to cut their teeth on this. And it seems like they all seem to be in the same realm too, because, um, is it ne Nema, how you pronounce his name? Now, uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, Nehemiah Purcell, which is actually Nehemiah, Nehemiah from the Bible. Yeah, Jack told me it was the name of the Bible. Uh, must have been a tough name in Hollywood. To, to, and he kept you know, it. It's his real I'm name. I'm surprised he didn't shorten it. Yeah, you know? and, he, and he kept it. And I researched him because I was waiting to see if he had like a really Jewish name that he changed. Because I told you before, Tony Curtis from your movie, Something Like It Hot, his real name is Bernard Schwartz. So he changed it to Tony yeah. Curtis. But I was going to say that he was in a lot of TV shows, yes. like you mentioned before. And he was in some, some Alfred Hitchcock as well. So yes. they all, they, they were sort of drawn to all that sort of uh, interesting world. All, it's interesting how this certain group of people, like I say, I always picture them back then going out for drinks after, you know, and, and, and talking and, and, and philosophizing and hanging out. Yep. You know, like imagine a party at, at, at Rod's house with some really cool characters. <laughs> yep, yep. And you know what? I did miss one. I overlooked one. The captain, uh, another trivia fact, the captain played by Ben Wright. The actor's name was Ben Wright. And I thought I had seen him before. He looked very familiar. Well, mm -hmm. I know why he's familiar. He was in two other episodes of The Twilight Zone. Death Heads Revisited, which we know that's about the Holocaust. And another one uh, called Dead Man's Shoes, which I remember that one. The guy puts on the shoes and he takes the, the he, he becomes somebody else. So he was in two other uh, episodes, the captain in this one. So that's why he looked okay. familiar. But you know, you were talking about Patrick Renee and the Avengers. I knew it was him even before I saw him because his voice, some actors and actresses have those unique voices that you say, that's that person. You just know, like, like yeah. Humphrey Bogart, you knew that was Bogey. You knew it was Cagney, Tony Curtis, doesn't matter what he played, even if he had an accent, sometimes he would do the accent and he would go back to sounding like a New Yorker. You always knew certain actors were there, yeah. or actresses were there. And you know, one other thing that in this episode that stood out for me was, the English actress, I forget her name now, when she was in the porthole and the fire was going and she was screaming, I was like, wow, that was intense, what they, that they endured. And that's why it was uh, hell because he had to go back and relive what he did, time. Yeah. And if, if that really is the, the way it is, man, ooh, that's, that's, that's a hell of a thing. And, you know, with your background, you know, you, you're on ships, obviously, right? Yeah. Or 
main but some no, Marines. No, I, was on I landed on. I was never stationed oh. on one, but I, but I landed on them during the war. Yeah, but I mean, I think in general, the submarine life, whatever side you were on, must have been the worst. Yeah, I can't imagine being under you know in that that tin can, you know, you know. I, I mean, they can be very cruel and, and take advantage because of their position, but at the same time, to be stuck in there, you can see probably see movies like Dust Bowl and stuff like that. And, yeah, and sort of these things. It's just an awful, like you know. Well, I tell you, <laughs> you mentioned about submarines during the war. The Gulf War was stationed in Sigonella, Sicily. And we delivered uh, classified material to Augusta Bay in Sicily. And we pulled up to the pier and there was a submarine. It was a US, I think it was a Dallas that was, it didn't, it didn't pull up all the way, but it pulled off. So it got on a boat, a little boat and you rode out to the side of it. When them guys come up, cause they hot rack and hot rack means like they'll do shifts. So there's only limited spaces where they can sleep. So like if you and I were in a submarine, you sleep in the bunk. And then when you get up and you go do your, you know, your time on watch, the next person goes and sleeps in a thing. But when they come up, they're all, they're real pale because they've been underwater for a, a long, long time. So it's got to be a, a strange feeling. Yeah. It's kind of like working in a, in a mine, you know, like a mine. Yeah. All yes. Up, you know? Yes. Yeah. Definitely. All right. I'll let you go first. What did you have for a rating? Um, <laughs> okay. I thought, I thought it was average. Okay. You know, it was interesting, but it was very simple. You know, it was one idea, but there were no, there was one major twist, but I kind of see it coming. I, I did anyways. Uh, but it was fine. It was good. It was, like I say, they're all good. It's just some better than others. This is just right down the center. Okay. How about you? Oh, I'm going to be completely opposite of you. You're going to be surprised what I gave it. Now, remember what I said, folks, about believing that Rod, that was a lot of Rod in there, uh, believing that he deserved the punishment that he got because I'm actually for so many evil like that, they should get what's coming to them. I'm one of those type of people. Yeah. So. But I gave it. Wow. A 10. And I'm going to tell you something. I've seen that episode many times and I've always liked it, but it didn't resonate. And it, I think it resonates with me more now because I'm older, obviously, but because I know Ann Serling personally now, and I know a lot of stuff that we've talked about privately about her dad that I know now. Um, and I think that made it resonate with me even more. And when we get up to uh, the episode of Death Heads, uh, Death Heads Revisited about the Holocaust, you, you know, it's really, really, really poignant. Um, and it's interesting. Again, like I said, the captain in this played in that episode as well. So that'd be interesting yeah, to see. Yeah. yeah, but you know, and I looked at went down IMDb for for Persoff, and he was a hell of an actor. He was even in. He probably played a, a rabbi or a cantor, and he was in Yentl. You remember Yentl with Barbara Streisand? Yeah. <laughs> Robert idea. Yep, he was in that. <laughs> so he'd been around forever and ever and ever. But, and he did yeah. a lot of the old, um, and Franciscus did too. You know, back in the 50s, they had all that live TV, which today people wouldn't appreciate today. You know, I, I love watching those old things because if you were a good actor, even if you flubbed your line, it came out. There was no way you could hide. You couldn't hide behind the scenery. They couldn't edit you out. What you brought was what you brought. And, and that Not great. Made, yeah. And, yeah, and that made actors... Uh, to me, even better. But uh, you know who started that? A little bit of trivia. Who who started the whole like you know doing the live studio audience with multi cameras? Like in the, in the old days, there was like one camera. But who started? Who, who who began or started the whole thing of like studio audience with like two or three cameras at the same time, different, different angles, which was revolutionary at the time. You know? I want to say, and I could be wrong, Jerry Lewis. No, it was uh, it was the. Uh, the, the the Lucy show like the Lucy Arnaz you know what do you call the show was, oh, oh Desi Arnaz yeah well it, Desi like, owned it De, yeah yeah they Desilu, had the company Desilu Desilu was Desilu the name of yeah. yeah they kind of very very I'm afraid of an ingenious in many ways with TV production and kind of uh, yeah that was thought it was interesting different and music too being a musician yeah in those days it wasn't pre-taped they had a band in another room yeah playing yeah. And that's what these would be voiceovers. They bring the band again, you know, today, you know, Marlboro cigarettes. And I mean, like, they'll be off. It was unbelievable. Everything was there, like, in, in, the, in the building, you know. Yeah. Being well, being, a, being a, a talented singer like you are and appreciating, you know, the history of music, you know, I've got air checks. I don't know if you know what an air check is of Sinatra. Sinatra used to do, you just said cigarettes. He used to do Lucky Strike. They had these TV, you know, they were big before yeah. they realized that cigarettes would kick your ass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They used to be billboards and everything. But Lucky Strike and all of those, you know, cigarette brands used yeah. to have TV shows and Sinatra would do air checks. And air checks, folks, if you don't know what that is, that's live in a, in a studio in front of people record and not, you know, cleaned up and all of that. Whatever, you know, 
pops and, and as Sinatra would say, peas, he called them pops and peas in his voice, you heard him. And I've got a lot of those on CD that I, I inherited from my Uncle Stan because he left me a Sinatra CD collection. But uh, so what you were That's talking right. about, whole, yeah, yeah. Uh, the whole different, whole different time in music. So anyways, what do you got, uh, what do you got coming up? Well, but we're slowly opening things up here slightly, you know. Um, you know what we're allowed now? Well, then, here's an example of how Ontario, like Ontario is right beside Quebec. You know, everybody knows Montreal, Quebec, Dif different provinces, like different states. In, um, in uh, Montreal last night, they had a big hockey game between Toronto and Montreal. Mm -hmm. There were allowed 2,500 people in the arena. It's not bad, right? Okay. You know what, they're allowed, what our, our stage we're at here? You'd like to have five people outdoors together, five people that know each other. The next step in 21 days is 10 people, and then, 20, then 25. Like, we are, we are so bad behind everything else in, in North. I think Ontario's got to be the worst place in, in North America right now for being too late on the, in the game. You know? wow. So, I mean, I'm, I'm doing okay, but I get, a lot of business has gone out of, out of business. <laughs> a lot of people yeah. are not going to make it. Yeah. But, yeah, but apart from that, uh, there's hope now. There's, uh, we're talking about stopping the... Um, the border hotels, I think you heard about those, where you get yeah. quarantined for three days at your own neck dime. It costs you yeah. like two two thousand dollars like that. They're special hotels. They found out they're having outbreaks in those hotels. They're actually more dangerous. Than them. So once that goes, it'll make it easier. I'm gonna get my second shot earlier. They sped it up. So okay. then I'll be good to go. Yeah. Okay. Well I'll be back you, in the States. And that's good because we we did our second shot, Pfizer, May 4th, no symptoms at all. So I carry my mask with me. I don't wear it all the time now especially outside, it is the CDC changing guidelines. So when I go in places, I don't, I don't wear the mask unless I come to the door, and that's why I always carry it with me in my pocket. If I come to the door and the establishment says you have to wear a mask, I have no problem with their rules. Hey. I try to tell people, stop with the bullshit with your rights. It's their right as their establishment yeah. to say they want you to wear a mask. You know, I, And yeah. I know when you, you take it off when you eat, of course, or if you have a drink, but if it's their establishment, it's their rules. It's, that's up to them. It's, if you don't want to wear the mask, then don't go in their establishment. And that's the biggest problem I have with people in the United States of America. Stop. Stop already. You go, whether, whether you're on the left or the right or you're in the middle, stop with the insanity. Stop. Get vaccinated because it's, it helps out humanity. It's the right thing to do. If a business says you got to wear a mask, wear the mask. You can sit down. You can take it off. You can eat. You put it back on when you go to the bathroom if you're in an establishment or you're walking out. It's just common courtesy to humanity. But we still got these clowns out here. You still got people. We're getting ready next month to, you know, to go to the Hall of Fame induction ceremony in Florida. We're flying Southwest. I don't know if you saw it. You had a person with a mask, a woman, punch another a flight attendant lady, older lady in the mouth, knock two of her teeth out. That's a federal offense because of a mask thing. Um, $35,000 fine. And now she's gonna wind up going to prison, which she should, arguing over a mask. Oh, so who, who did the punching? The, 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 the No, not the, the lady hit the flight attendant. She punched. You got people that don't want to wear their mask, uh -huh. and the airlines are saying, you got to wear the mask on a plane. I don't want to wear it. Or they keep it down here, and they come to them, and they say, you got to put it above your nose. No, I'm not putting it. It's my right not to do it. You know, if it was up to me, and I was on the plane, I'd open up the side door and throw them out at 35,000 feet. And yeah. that would end that. But... Uh, I thought you could open up the window and get some fresh air, but you want to pull them out. <laughs> yeah. You know what? There's actually a good side to this. You know, it's like uh, in the winter here, it was really nice having your face covered, you know, in, in the sleet and the snow. The other thing is you can go out anytime you want, the grocery store or whatever, or if you want to go outside. Don't worry about shaving. You know, if you want, don't worry about makeup. You just go out. Who knows what's under there, right? And as I, some friend, I heard some uh, acquaintance say, and I thought it was a little vain, but... Um, He's a musician himself, but he said, wow, this is great. I can go out. Nobody recognizes me. Nobody bothers me. <laughs> As if, you know, that's, that's not you know, a little out there, but there's, uh, there's good sides to it. You know, it's going to, all of a sudden, we're all going to be like, hey, you know, recognizable and um, in everybody's face again. Not, 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 right now, we're all kind of like uh, anonymous, which is yeah. a strange thing. You know, there's an episode of The Twilight Zone where everybody becomes just an entity, not a name, like a... I mean, people do recognize you by your eyes. I walk into places and they, they know me right away by my hair or whatever. But a lot of places, people would know each other. So it's kind of a, a premise for a strange episode, you know. But all of a sudden, because of a mask, we're all equal or all sort of, uh, you know, 
I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. Yeah, but it's it's interesting. It's, it's changed, I think, our way how we how we behave in public. And I think even when the masks eventually come off, if they do, we're going to be a little different. I think a little. Yeah. I don't know. So I but think you, but you know what, Gore? Too, and then I'll tie this in. I want to ask you a question too about in the eighties with the spoons. Um, we always, you know, you and I have talked off camera. I know we're on camera now, but we have talked off camera about boundaries, and, and you know what I'm talking about. But people should have, you know, people in, in, and I know it's around the world, but I can only speak for America, even though I lived around the world. Boundaries, people have a, a thing, whether it's social media, whether it's in person, crossing boundaries. And then of course, when you call them out on it, they're the victim. They, they cross into your boundary and they, they go too far. You would hope with the social distancing because of, you know, COVID, that people would understand that people do have personal space. And I'm not saying that, that, oh, you're Gord or I'm Brad, I'm better than anybody. I don't look at it, I'm not like that, and neither are you. But there's still your personal space. You know, if, if you're out at, at dinner with somebody and someone does recognize you from the spoons, it's still your personal space. You know, if they want a picture or an autograph or something like that, at least let you get through dinner and, you know, not interrupting you. Or maybe you're on a business meeting and, they, you know, it's boundaries. And I hope that some people that didn't get it before understand that there really are boundaries and there really is personal space. And uh -huh. it took a pandemic to get some people say, you know, they say get, get a V8 uh, to realize, hey, there's boundaries. But I got to ask you because I had this vision. So at the height of the spoons back in the day, when you were like, you know, all the girls were chasing you, especially at the concerts, did you ever have to put a, a disguise on or anything at all to, to go out somewhere? No, no, no. I mean, we, we ha I had a guy in the crew, though, who looked a little bit like me, and he, he pretended he was me many times. <laughs> oh, I bet that like, had perks. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think he was a happy guy. Because um, at the time, Sandy and I were dating all that time, so, you know, we were not looking for anything. But he would, like, go out ahead of me and, like, get to his car. All the girls would run after him, and then, then I could sneak out the other way. <laughs> So I had, a I had a decoy instead of a mask. <laughs> so you didn't put on, you never put on the uh, the terrible Groucho Marx glasses and the <laughs> nose and the cigar. <laughs> uh, well, it is funny. One of our videos, uh, Tell No Lies videos, there's a scene where uh, the, it takes place on an airplane and there's a captain of the plane and he's got those nose glasses on, right? And it, we, it was full of characters, that, that our friends, and there was a famous DJ uh, radio personality from Toronto. His name was Live Old Jive. He's actually from the States. Okay. And he worked with Casey Kasem. I was like, you live in California now. But it was funny because there's a scene where he's the captain of the plane. And, you know, there's all these cameos in our video. He takes off the nose glasses. And he kind of looks the same underneath. He's got the same glasses <laughs> and the same mustache. <laughs> it was like, oh, okay. Funny. Yeah. Well, I want, you, I want you to plug something. I know we don't usually plug our stuff. But I want you to because a lot of the viewers of this hit me up on Twitter in the DM and stuff. And they ask about yeah. the spoons. You know, even, even people that are uh, becoming new fans of the spoons because they – they hear me talking about it a lot. Um, tell them about your new CD and where they can get it. Yeah, it's like, it's a, it's, since our 40th anniversary, it's, it's a compilation of all our stuff. And it's perfect for our new fans in America and Europe that are just catching on. So they don't have to buy everything. This has got all the important stuff. It's called Repeatable, you know, which is kind of a, a cool title because it's worth repeating. Um, you can get it through our website, spoonsmusic.com. You can... You know, you can just, just, you know, it's obviously on iTunes and Bandcamp, all the other, you know, platforms. But if you want to get a signed copy, it's a CD and double vinyl. And, and a vinyl is big again. We made it, it actually opens up. To me, I mean, I've never had a double vi vinyl before. They just to have that as a mm -hmm. kid, remember getting a double vinyl and opening it. And like, there's this whole world you get lost in. And so that, the vinyl's not quite ready. You wouldn't believe the, the backlog of people making vinyl right now. This, mm -hmm. It's Everybody's doing vinyl. The CD is available. I guess I do spoonsmusic.com is the easiest. Or just, just Google it or just go to, you know, your regular place where you download your music from. It'll be there. So Spoon's repeatable. Repeatable. Okay. And as everyone knows, Gordon is very modest. And I, I'm very big. I'm, big I'm not really. I just, you know. Yeah, right. It's, it's an act. You know, you, you know, he's trying not to become an actor now. We'll talk about that in another episode. But... In my rotation, I always talk about this is uh, Romantic Traffic, Nova Heart. And I, I, there's an extended version, like a six minute one that I always got on loop in, on YouTube. Uh, Nova Heart, Old Emotions, and your new one, which is in with the spoons, but I play that a lot too, uh, with Victoria Rowe. What was the name of the song? 
Oh, the better ending? Yeah, better ending. I played that a lot, too. And you liked the first and last time. You liked that one. The first, too, right? Oh, love the first and last time. Absolutely. That's a, that's a newer one, but it's, yeah. it's, it's on the compilation. Yep. Oh, cool. Um, but the house that Deb and I are moving into soon, believe it or not, has a finished basement. And the owner has left a dance floor and a disco ball above the dance floor. And to the side, he's left me a pool, which I, a pool table, which I don't even know how to play pool. I'm going to learn. And Deb as well. So I'm going to put up on Twitter uh nova heart uh, playing in my uh, entertainment base and once i get everything up on the walls i'm gonna do a video with all of my stuff i'm finally gonna have space to put up all of my sinatra yeah, cool. and all of my uh entertainment stuff down there but i'm gonna be playing nova heart and i'm gonna have the disco ball going even though we know it's not a disco song but i'm still gonna have the disco ball going just because it's a cool effect but pick that up and just so you know gordon i still haven't got the package you'll probably wind up uh, being oh. sent to, well, you know, it's coming from Canada, so it, it probably had to go qu through quarantine if you leave it up to Trudeau. He, he probably, yeah. Trudeau probably opened it up first. So, yeah. so I'll, I'll let you know when I get it. But hey, folks, we're going to get back to doing these uh, regular schedule. Um, we may miss one when I'm, I'm moving if my internet is not up. But other than that, I know a lot of people say, hey, what, what's up with the show? We're not ending it. I just got caught up in these, in these moves and selling and, and us buying a house. So and, and Gord was there before we started shooting the show, so he understands. All right, so as we always do, that's another episode of Last Stop, the Twilight Zone show. I'll say goodbye from America. Goodbye from Canada. Until next time.